2001 Canadian Open Mathematics Challenge, Part B. The triangular region T has its vertices determined by the intersections of three lines. X plus 2Y is 12, X equals 2, and Y is equal to 1. Determine the coordinates of the vertices of T and show this region on the grid provided. Well, I don't have a grid, so I'll just draw a basic diagram and let's talk about it. We have here our x-axis, our y-axis, and a couple of these lines are pretty easy. x equals 2, and that's just, uh, if this is 2, this is the line x equals 2 up here, right? It keeps on going. And then y equals 1, that's pretty straightforward. If this is 1, this is the line y equals 1. Also keeps going, right? Indefinitely in either direction for both of those lines. And then we have the third line, which is x plus 2y is 12. We need two points, and then we can join them. So if x plus 2y is equal to 12, we can easily find two points. We just find the intercepts of the x and y axis. When y is 0, x is 12. So I'll just stick that out here somewhere. And when uh, x is 0, y is 6, uh, approximately here. And then let's join those two. And there you go. It won't be perfectly drawn to scale, but you guys get the idea. So this is the triangular region right here that these lines create right there. And they want you to find the vertices. Okay, that shouldn't be a problem. Let's label them first. Let's label this A, this B, and this C. Okay, so A is the intersection of what? The intersection of x plus 2y is 12, and x equals 2. So that's pretty straightforward. Substitute x equals 2 into the first equation. You get 2 plus 2y is 12, and therefore y looks like uh, 5. So this point A is 2, 5. Those are the coordinates for x and y. Same kind of story for B. Well, B is the easiest one, I think, because it's the intersection of x equals 2 and y equals 1. Well, therefore, b, the coordinates are 2, 1. That's it. And then c, that is the intersection of that line x plus 2y is 12, and then the line y equals 1. When you substitute y equals 1 into this equation, you get x equal to 10. So c, the coordinates, are 10 and 1. And I believe that is part A. Determine the coordinates of the vertices and show this region on the grid provided. Okay. Now we turn our attention to part B. The line x plus y is 8 divides the triangular region T into a quadrilateral Q and triangle R. Determine the coordinates of the vertices of the quadrilateral Q. So the first thing is let's try to draw a that line on this graph. When x, when y is 0, x will be 8. And when x, is, when y is 0, when x is 0, y will be 8. So that means the coordinates of the intercepts are 8 and 8. So approximately, yeah, here, let's say, and approximately here. So we'll join those two. And there you go. So we've got a really nice diagram, I think. And that line, which is represented by x plus y is 8, which I drew in green, did indeed cut that triangular region, which is this one, into two uh, segments, one being a triangle and one being a quadrilateral. Triangle they have called R, and the quadrilateral they have called Q. Okay. And they want you to figure out the coordinates of the vertices of Q. Well, the vertices are going to be A, B, and then I've got to label a couple more, right? So uh, whatever letter you want to use, D and E. So this vertice here I will call D, squeeze that in there, and that vertice I will call E. Okay, well, A, the, that vertice we already figured out was 2, 5. And then B, we also already figured that out, was 2, 1. 
So now we just have to figure out D and E. Okay. Well, D is what? It's the intersection of X plus Y is 8 and Y is equal to 1, correct? So if you substitute that back, it just gives you X is 7. So that means D, the coordinates, I'll just write it here. D is 7, 1. Yeah, D is 7, 1. Okay. And then now we have to figure out E. E is the intersection of X plus Y is 8 and X plus 2Y is 12. Correct? So then we can isolate for X. In this one, the first one, X is 8 minus Y. And then the second one, X is 12 minus 2Y. If we set them equal to each other, we get X minus Y is equal to 12 minus 2Y. So that means that, um, let's see here, to, uh, adding 2y to both sides would give me y, and then 12 minus 8 is 4. Substitute that back into any one of these, and we get x is equal to 4. So e, the coordinates of e, are 4, 4. Yeah, so there you have it. That's the coordinates for A, B, D, and E. And those four points make up the vertices of the quadrilateral Q. And then finally, determine the area of the quadrilateral. Okay, let's just see if I can stick, stay on one page here. I think I can. I think I can squeeze it in. The area of Q, so area of Q is essentially the area of triangle ABC, the big guy, ABC, this whole thing, minus the triangle EDC, which we had, well, actually the question had labeled as R. And I think that should be pretty straightforward. One half base times height, the base is from here to here, right? So you're going from 2, 1 to 10, 1, so that's a distance of 8. So the base is 8. The height is from here to here, so you're going from 2, 1 to 2, 5. So if you look at the y coordinates, 1 to 5 is a distance of 4. All right, that's great. EDC, again, another triangle, 1 half base times height. This time you're going from there to there. So D was what? 7, 1. So you're going from 7 to C, which is 10, 1. So that's a distance of 3. And then the height, the height is here. So you're going from uh, the line y equals 1 to e, which was 4, 4, if you recall. So you're going from 1 to 4, so that means that's 3. The height is 3. And there you go. So this looks like 16 minus 9 over 2. And 16 minus 9 over 2 is 23 over 2. That completes number one. Alphonse and Beryl are playing a game starting with a pack of seven cards. Alphonse begins by discarding at least one, but not more than half, of the cards in the pack. He then passes the remaining cards in the pack to Beryl. Beryl continues the game by discarding at least one, but not more, than half of the remaining cards in the pack. The game continues in this way with the pack being passed back and forth between the two players. The loser is the player who, at the beginning of his or her turn, receives only one card. Show with justification that there is always a winning strategy for barrel. Let's make a little table. We'll call this the player, either A or B, Alphonse or Beryl. What did they start with? Start with... What can they remove? And let's see here. What they can pass. And what they should pass. In order to have this winning strategy for barrel. All right. So here we go. Let's try to. Hopefully this will make sense. And. 
give me a winning strategy. Okay. So who goes first? Alfonso begins, right? So player A. He starts with seven cards. He can remove, according to the question, at least one, but not more than half. So he can remove one, two, or three cards because he can't remove four because four would be more than half the number of cards that he started with, which was seven. So he can remove that, and then once he removes that, he can pass what's remaining. So for example, if he removed one, he would be left with six, and he passes those to the barrel. So he can pass six. If he removes two, he would be able to pass five. If he removes three from the deck, he would have four remaining, and he'd be able to pass four. Now he should pass, well, we'll skip that for now, because we're really interested in a strategy that will win for barrel. So it's barrel strategy here, based on what Alphonse does. So we'll concentrate on the should pass column when we come to barrel. Who is next? Now barrel starts with either six, five, or four. It all depends on what happened with Alphonse, right? So if we start with six, uh, or five, or four, we have to figure out how many can barrel remove. Well, it really depends, right? I if barrel starts with uh, six, then she can remove one, two, or three. If she starts with five, she can remove only one or two. And if she starts with four, she can remove one or two. So that depends. Can pass, well, again, depends uh, on this scenario. If that was the case, she can pass five, four, or three. If that was the case, she can pass four or three. If that was the case, she can pass three or two. But now we have to concentrate on the should pass because we want a winning strategy. For her to guarantee herself to win, she should pass three. And what that means is that Whatever Alphonse did, whatever Beryl is left with, she's got to pass three. So if she started with six, can she pass three? Yeah, she can. If she started with five, can she pass three? Yep. And if she started with four, can she pass uh, three? And the answer is yes. In order for her to pass three in this scenario, she would have had to have removed three. In order for her to pass three in this scenario, she would have had to have removed two. In order to pass three in that scenario, she would have had to have removed one. So whatever Alphonse did, she has to match it appropriately, her decisions, in order to end up with this being passed to Beryl. Oh, sorry, Alphonse, being passed to Alphonse. So he starts with the three that she passed over to him. Okay. Now, Alphonse, he, at this point, has only one choice. He can only remove one card because he can't remove two because that would be more than half of the cards in the pack. So he has one choice, and therefore, when he removes that one card, he only has two cards left. And that's what he passes over to Beryl. Now, at this point, Beryl, again, has only one choice which is she can only remove one and therefore she has only one card left and that's what she has to pass over to Alphonse. Alphonse then gets one card and he therefore loses. Why? Because read the question. The loser is the player who at the beginning of his or her turn receives only one card. So according to that definition Alphonse loses and Beryl wins. This is the winning strategy for Beryl. And as you can see, no matter what Alphonse does, Beryl can, especially in this step, this is the crucial step, make the appropriate choice to ensure that it proceeds in this way, which will guarantee that if Alphonse loses and Beryl wins. Part B. Alphonse and Beryl now play a game with the same rules as in Part A, except this time they start with a pack of 52 cards. Alphonse goes first again. 
As an A, a player on his or her turn must discard at least one, but not more than half of the remaining cards from the pack. Is there a strategy that Alphonse can use to be guaranteed that he will win? Provide a justification. So the same sort of story. I will make the same chart. Player starts with uh, his remove choices. Can remove and then can pass. And then, of course, we have to then concentrate on what should be done in order to create a winning strategy, this time for Alphonse. All right, so here we go. And this is now with 52 cards, not seven. In the previous one, it was seven cards. Okay, so who's going first here? Uh, Alphonse goes first again. All right, so Alphonse goes first. He starts with 52 cards. Now, he can remove anywhere from one to ha up to half the deck, right? So anywhere from one to 26 cards. If he removes anywhere from one to six, 26 cards, he can pass what's remaining. So what's remaining in the deck will be anywhere from 26 to 51 cards. For example, if he removed, let's say, 21 cards, this is just an example, he would have 31 cards remaining, correct? Now, should pass, I selected this number in particular because that is how many he should pass in order for this winning strategy to work. 31 is that key number. All right, then we get to Beryl. Beryl then receives those 31 cards. Now, she can pass anywhere from 1 to 15, because she can't go more than 15, because if she went 16, that's more than half the deck. So let's say that she passes um, X number of cards, or she removes X number of cards. X is anywhere from 1 to 15, correct? Now, once she removes it, how many are left, meaning how many can she pass on? Well, if she removes 1, there'd be 30 cards left. If she removes 15, there's 16 cards left. So how many she can pass is anywhere between 16 to 30. Now, we are saying she pass, she removed X. So that means what is remaining, and therefore what she can pass, is represented by 31 minus X, correct? 31 is what you started with, and X is what you removed. What's remaining is 31 minus X, and that is what she will pass. So she passes 31 minus X. Let's separate them to ensure. Okay. So far, so good. All right. Now we get to Alphonse. Alphonse now receives this 31 minus X, whatever X is, number of cards. Now, at this point, again, we have another magic number that sort of guarantees and that magic number is 15. Now, you might say, well, where are you getting this from? Like, are you pulling it out of a hat, or how are you figuring, it, figuring that out? Well, the key is eventually you want to be able to get down to, you'll have, let's see here, B, A, B. You want to be able to get down to a point where barrel has seven, just as in part A. If barrel has seven, then you can use the strategy in part A to ensure this exact strategy to ensure that barrel loses, identical to what we did in part A. And that's how I'm trying to get down to seven by using what is sort of like halves. And it'll be a little bit more clear once I finish this whole table. Okay, so then in order to get to 15, how many do I need to remove? I need to remove 16 minus X. This is how much I should, should remove. 
31 minus x minus 31 minus x minus 16 minus x. If you do that math, it is 15. So that's how many she will pass, and that's how many she should pass. And 15 goes here. All right. Now, at this point, she's going to remove a certain number, and that number is anywhere from 1 to 7. So y is anywhere between 1 and 7 y being the number that she removes. And then how many she passes is basically 15 minus y. Now, she therefore passes 15 minus y, and that's what ends up here. And then now we get into this crucial stuff again that in order to win, we want this to basically be 7, right? This is what goes here. And for that to happen, this will be 8 minus y should remove. Because if you have 15 minus y and then you subtract from it 8 minus y, you will get 7. And that is how much Alphonse will pass the barrel. Now, at this point, once barrel gets 7, now we basically just, now you just use the strategy in part A of this question and that will ensure that barrel loses and Alphonse wins. So once it gets to 7, B starts with 7. Here, you notice A started with 7, and the strategy makes A lose. So here, if B starts with 7, the same strategy will ensure that B loses, and therefore Alphonse wins. And that is what Part B wants you to do, create a strategy that guarantees that he will win. So we started with 52, and basically we wanted to get it down to 7, and these were the key uh, moves, in particular concentrating on Alphonse. If f at x is equal to x squared plus 6x plus c, where c is an integer, prove that f at 0 plus f at negative 1 is odd. So what is f at 0? f at 0 plus f at negative 1. According to this, it would be c, if you put 0 into here, everything disappears except the c, and then this would be uh, negative 1 squared, which is 1, plus 6 times negative 1, which is minus 6, plus c. So that looks like it's just 2c minus 5. Okay? Well, I can put 2c minus 6 plus 1, which was essentially what we had up here. And then I can factor out a 2, and that would be c minus 3 plus 1. Now, c is an integer, so therefore c minus 3 will also be an integer. So I'll just call it m. So this can be written as 2m plus 1. And all odd numbers are of the form 2m plus 1. So this is odd. And that's what they're saying you need to prove. That's pretty straightforward. Okay, let's move over to part B. Let g at x is equal to x to the power of 3 plus px squared plus qx plus r, where p, q, and r are integers. Prove that if g at 0 and g at negative 1 are both odd, then the equation g at x is equal to 0 cannot have three integer roots. First, let's assume that we have a scenario where it does have three integer roots. So we will make an assumption, and then we will prove this assumption to be wrong. So our original assumption is that this g at x, which is up here, 
has three roots. So g at x could be written in the form x minus a, x minus b, x minus c, if it has three roots where a, b, and c are the roots. All right. And therefore, you could solve, you could put 0 here, and then therefore, x would be equal to either a, b, or c. x would be either, either a, b, or c, right? So if this is our original assumption, then that means x minus a times x minus b times x minus c is equal to g at x, right, up here. And g at x, they have given us as this big, long thing which is x to the power of 3 plus px squared plus qx plus r. Okay, so first thing is let's expand this all out, and then we will collect, um, we will collect like terms. Yeah. So when you expand this all out and collect like terms, on this side you get x to the power of 3 minus a, plus b plus c in brackets x squared plus b c plus a c plus a b and that's the coefficient for x and then we have minus a b c and that of course equals the other side which is x to the power of 3 plus p x squared plus q x plus r all right okay great so we need to compare coefficients. Look, for example, this is equal to this, this is equal to that, this is equal to that. But before we compare, we need to start talking a little bit about this part of the question that these two are odd, and that's going to help us. So g at 0, they're saying, is odd. Well, what is g at 0 when we substitute 0 for x? It would be just equal to r. So they're saying g at 0 is odd, so that means r is odd. Okay, now we get to the second piece of information that g at negative 1 is also odd. Well, what is g at negative 1? If we put negative 1 for x in there, you'd get, let's see here, negative 1 uh, plus p minus q plus r, correct? And they're saying that's odd. Okay, let's talk about this now. That means this whole thing must is has to be odd. So, right? Because if this is odd, then this, that means that whole thing is odd. So this whole thing is odd. But we have already figured out that R is odd up here. So just this guy is odd. So that means that these three must be even because an even and an odd becomes an odd okay so for example uh, whatever right if this was 5 and this is 8 it would be 13 and it matches up so we conclude from this that minus 1 plus p minus q is even And if that's the case, that means that p minus q is odd, since there's only one difference between these two terms. Okay, p minus q is odd. So that means one of those is even, and one of those is odd. For example, if this was 10, then this is 3. And that means that 10 minus 3 is 7, and 7 is odd. And the only way you can get uh, two numbers to subtract from one another and to get odd is for one to be even and one to be odd. So in this case, p was 10, which is even, and q was 3, which is odd. So that means I conclude that with p and q, one is even, one of those, either p or q, and the other one is odd. All right, so I hope you followed. I hope that wasn't confusing. Okay, now we can go back and compare the coefficients. So here we go. So this is equal to this guy, right? So that means we've got minus a plus b plus c in brackets is equal to p. 
and then this whole thing is equal to Q comparing coefficients so BC plus AC plus AB is equal to Q and then this guy is equal to that guy so that means we've got uh, what is it minus ABC is equal to R all right so now let's talk about this R we had concluded was odd right so this guy is odd so that means that all three must be odd a must be odd B must be odd and C must be odd that's the only way you can get a product so for example if you had like 3, 5, and 7, 3 times 5 is 15. Uh, 15 times 7 is 75. I'm sorry, 105. So 105 is odd. So you, you see what I mean? All three must be odd. A must be odd, B must be odd, and C must be odd. Okay, great. Now let's turn our attention to which one you want to do the next, this one. This one, we I think we figured out that uh, in this one here, that at least one is even and one is odd, right? Okay, great. Either P is odd or, or Q is odd. Well, we don't know which one is which, right? We didn't designate them. So let's just concentrate on the ABC part. A is odd, B is odd, and C is odd according to my little analysis over there. So if you take three numbers that are odd, A is odd, B is odd, and C is odd, and you add them, three odd numbers, let's just say there were three, five, and seven, when you add them together, it's 15, which is odd. So this whole thing is odd. And then it's just a negative in front of it. Okay, great. That, that means that P is odd, right? Because P is equal to this guy. Okay, so, we now concentrate on what's left. This guy right here. This is the only one that's left. Q, we don't know, but we do know a little bit about A, B, and C. B and C are both odd, so when you multiply them together, say 5 times 7, that's 35. That's going to be odd. A and C are both odd. Let's just say they were 3 and 5. When you multiply them together, it's 15, which is odd. A times B. Oh, sorry, the f this one was 8 times uh, C, which is 7. It doesn't really matter, which is 21, which is odd. And then AB is 3 times 5, which was 15, which is odd. So then, again, you have three odd numbers. When you add them together, it would be an odd. Three odd numbers added together will be odd. Very similar to here, actually. So this whole thing is odd. Therefore, Q is odd. Okay. So I just showed that this is odd and this is odd. But that is a problem because it contradicts what we found up here. What we found up here is that P and Q, one is even and one is odd. So let's we'll just call that statement one. That, so what we found out here contradicts one. And therefore, that means that g at x equals 0 cannot have three integer roots. Why? Because this whole thing fell apart. It contradicts what we found out, and therefore our original assumption is wrong. So we'll just put that in there to make it complete because our original assumption is incorrect. So I hope you followed that, and that would be sufficient in order to prove what they wanted you to do in this part B of number three. Triangle ABC is isosceles with AB equal to AC is equal to 5 and BC is equal to 6. Point D lies on AC and P is the point on BD so that 
angle APC is 90 degrees if angle ABP and is equal to angle BCP, determine the ratio of AD to DC. All right. So let's keep that in mind here. We want to find AD over DC. That's basically what this means. And we are told, what are we told? That BM I'm sorry, AB and AC are equal to 5. So AB is 5 and AC is 5, like that. And then BC down here is 6. And then we are told that APC is 90 degrees. So APC, this guy right here is 90 degrees. And then ABP, ABP is equal to BCP, BCP. So that means that if this is alpha here, BCP, this is alpha right here. Hope you can see that, this angle. All right. Now, since this is isosceles, this angle will be the same as that angle. So that means that if I call this theta, this angle right here, then that means that this angle will be theta here. And the reason is because this whole angle has to equal that whole angle because this is an isosceles triangle with that side is the same as that side. All right, so I think that's pretty decent. And I will then try to make this diagram a little bigger. And I think that should be sufficient worth our labeling. Okay, so here we go. Now, I think there was a question recently where I had done this where you had to draw a circle around. So I'll do it again. So we've got to draw a circle and that is going to make sense once I start explaining it. And that circle basically has to cut through the vertices of that triangle like that. Like that. Okay, now the reason I did that is because very similar, they have told me that this triangle has a 90 degree angle. And if that's so, and you draw a circle like that, then that means that that is the diameter A to C. So AC is the diameter. That's a rule. Why? Because that angle, APC, is 90 degrees. And that was given in the question. So that is something that's going to help us. All right. So here we go. The next step is you want to join P down to the base. Now, we are going to make a line going from A down to the base first, and that will split the base into half since this is isosceles, like that. And since this is going to be a perpendicular uh, line, and since this is isosceles, it splits the base into two. So that point right there, I will denote as M right there, and therefore uh, BM is equal to MC. So since the whole length is 6, we'll just put it on the side here. BM is equal to 3, and therefore MC is also equal to 3. And then now I want to join uh, P to M, that line right there. All right, so now we have to discuss something known as uh, subtended angles. So I'll explain. Let's say we've got two points, and in particular, we've got P and M. Now, look at those two points, and notice that they both subtend to form an angle PMC. If you extend the line from P and extend the line t from M, they join at C, and PMC, uh, or PCM rather, is alpha, correct? Now, if you do the same thing with P and M, 
you extend the line from P and you extend the line from M, they meet at A, and that angle will be the same as this angle. That's a rule. So let me write that out in words. Since P and M subtend to form angle PCM, right? And P and M also subtend to form angle PAM, that means that PAM is equal to PCM, which is alpha. So this angle in here is alpha. That one right there, from here to here. All right? And in a very similar way, P and A subtend to form an angle ACP, right? P and A. Where's P and A? Here's P and here's A. If you extend them, they join at C to form this angle, ACP, which we have denoted as theta. But P and A also subtend to form another angle, and that is AMP. P and A also subtend to form another angle here, and that angle is AMP, and it will be equal. Angle AMP, angle, and therefore that is also theta. So AMP, which is this guy in here, is also theta. Okay, so hopefully that isn't too messy. All right, now that we're done with that stuff, we can hopefully solve this question. So let's move this up a little bit, give us a little bit more space. Okay, I think that should be enough to solve. Now notice with similar triangles that these two triangles are now similar. MPA is similar to triangle BPC. Now, to convince you that they're similar, I'm going to draw them. And they're not going to be drawn to scale, but just to kind of give you an idea. So the first one is uh, MPA, directly from the diagram above, but I'm just drawing it. MPA, the angles are theta, and this is alpha. Now the other... Uh, triangle BPC, that one, uh, B, P, C, the angles are theta and alpha. So since two angles are the same, the third angle will also be the same. So we'll just call it beta. It doesn't really matter what you call it. So they're definitely similar. So since they're similar, we can get a ratio of the sides. So that means that PA over PC is the same as MA over BC. Now M to A, uh, we have to figure that out. We have, actually haven't figured that out yet, but that's easy because it's a Pythagorean relationship. If you look at that triangle, A at the top, M here, C here, AC is five, right? MC is three. So you can easily figure out that A to M is 4. One, this is the most common Pythagorean triangle, 3, 4, 5. So AM or MA is 4. And then BC, B to C is 6. So that means this is 2 over 3. All right, great. And then PA over PC, therefore, is equal to 2 over 3. And PA over PC is, interestingly, the equivalent of the tan of theta. If you look at this triangle here and look at that angle theta, the tan is opposite over uh, adjacent. Then the opposite is PA and the adjacent is PC. Okay, so hopefully that is going to be helpful and then the cotangent which we will use later is the reciprocal which is 3 over 2. All right so hopefully this challenging question is so far being explained well I hope and now we've got 
two steps left to get to the final answer. Now, the next step is we have to use the sine law on triangle BDC. So where's BDC? B, D, C, this guy. Okay. So we've got DC over the sine of theta is equal to BC over the sine of that angle, which is angle BDC. We haven't actually denoted it as anything. Okay. This is what we will proceed with. So first let's isolate for DC. BBC times sine theta over sine of BDC. Okay. Now we get into a little bit of, not super tricky, but somewhat uh, manipulation of those trig laws and all that stuff. Well, BC we know, right? BC is 6, I think. Yeah, BC is 6. So plug that into there. So that's 6. Sine theta, I think we'll leave that alone for now. And then this guy here, BDC is this angle, right? This angle in here. So BDC is really 180 minus uh, DCB, or so rather BDC, this guy right here, BDC would be 180 minus theta minus this angle, correct? Because all the angles add up to 180. Okay, so let's go back. So this BDC is equivalent to 180 minus that theta minus that angle DCB according to the diagram. Okay, the 6 sine theta we leave it alone for now and then we've got to expand this guy but first we can use the trig identity that means that this is equivalent to the sine of uh, theta plus angle DCB. And then we have to expand it using that trig identity, sine of A plus B, that kind of thing. So it becomes a sine of theta cos of DCB plus the cos of theta sine of DCB. Okay, now we're getting somewhere here. Now, this sine of theta and sine of theta here, those cancel. So we can just put a 6 there, and then we just have the cos of DCB. And then if we combine this guy with this guy, it's 10, but we're going to keep it in the denominator so it's going to be cotangent which is the reciprocal times the sine of dcb at this point i think we can get numerical values for each of these guys so dc is equal to six over cos of dcb dcb is this angle right here right dcb is this angle right here and we can get the cos just by looking at this triangle So the cos is uh, adjacent over hypotenuse. Adjacent is 3, and hypotenuse is 5. So this is 3 over 5, this cos of DCB. Cotangent of theta we have up here. That's why I said it would be used later. So that's 3 over 2. And then the sine of DCB from the same triangle is this over the hypotenuse, which is 4 over 5. And we had actually figured that out over here, too. So times 4 over 5. And there we go. This all crunches out into 10 over 3. 
All right, great. So we got DC is equal to 10 over 3. DC is 10 over 3. Okay, so they want me to find AD over DC. That's my final step, right? Okay, so DC was 10 over 3. That's what I just figured out. Uh, AD is the full length, which is 5, minus DC. So it would be 5 minus 10 over 3. And 5 minus 10 over 3 is 5 over 3. So finally, we can do this AD over DC. AD over DC looks to me like it's 5 over 3 over 10 over 3. And that is 1 half. 1 half is the answer to this very challenging question, number 4.